get started. Uh, as I let everybody know at the beginning of these things, we are recording them to post on YouTube. Um, so if you don't want your face on YouTube, um, don't have your video up. Um, just a couple quick announcements. First of all, as we announced last time, Saturday, February 26th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we will be doing a um, fossil, please touch fossil open house at home, uh, Homestead, uh, High Banks. High Banks. High Banks Park Nature Center uh, up by Worthington. And uh, they're expecting quite the crowd, several hundred people are expecting. So come early, um, should be a good program. Uh, the second thing I will mention, if you didn't see it on our Facebook page, um, our foray into homeschooling programs continues. And on Tuesday morning, I did our first uh, in-person program, which was also a fossil program for the Gaither Homeschool Co-op in Reynoldsburg. And that went very well. The kids were thrilled, absolutely thrilled. So I, I was very happy with that. Uh, third thing I will just mention real quick, I was contacted by a gentleman uh, named David Haig, who runs something called the Coyote Run Nature Preserve, which is part state preserve, uh, but mostly is private preserve. Uh, I went out there for a visit this afternoon, uh, tooled around in his gator for about three hours. Uh, my initial impression was this place was about 90 acres. Well, it's about 400 acres. And uh, they've got a lot of wooded areas. Um, they have over 35 vernal pools, uh, the largest being in wooded areas. Some of it's agricultural uh, use, which they are strictly doing that to pay the bills. Um, they have a very nice, very large shelter um, called the Tabernacle, uh, where they do programs in the summer, and they are looking to do more programs, um, looking for people to help with things that they need to do and really don't know a lot about, such as vernal pool surveys, uh, salamander counts, things like that. But it was a very interesting afternoon, and we are definitely going to do some things together out there. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with the program. Um, Christy is going to kick us off. I'm going to start us on a uh, more of a, a macro view about what stewardship is, more of a worldview. Um, I'm going to distill it down from the generals down to more specifics. Don's going to get into much more detail about exactly with your property. Okay, my screen share should come on right now. All right, is it up now, everybody? Yeah. Don? Okay, uh -huh. perfect. Okay, so, so we're talking about stewardship. We had a section in our OCVN classes. Um, we talked about some of our students that had woodlands behind their house or on their property and what stewardship um, really means and it's about protecting your land and what you can do and a lot of people say individual efforts really don't matter it's all industry but it, it does matter and you're going to see a little bit more of that in just a second here and oh wow i am just Okay, try it again. So stewardship is all about carefully managing the land and all of its resources to ensure natural systems are maintained or enhanced for future generations. That was right from our OCVN manual at the introduction to um, the section, the, the chapter on stewardship. And I'm adding to that is because our survival depends on this and not to 
be really doom and gloom, but we have to be alarmed right now. And the survival of humans depends on being part of the world ecosystems as we are. And the big word here also is sustainability of our natural resources. Uh, the sustainability of these will determine the, it determines the future and the capacity of supporting a population. It's, it's you know, no secret that we are severely over, overpopulated for this planet, more than we can handle. We've had to amend farming practices. We've had a lot of um, changes, let's say, to the landscape because of what we've had to do to support the population. And right now, it's unsustainable. We are, we are losing our natural resources at an unsustainable rate. The threats to that are, as you're very well aware, just by being here, are our changing climate slash global warning. The humans are changing the land, which changes the land's function. Um, we're gonna go into this a little bit about runoff um, and depletion of water tables. When you have all concrete, where does the runoff go and how that changes it? We change the course of rivers. We have, um, filled in wetlands, we have altered streams or filled them in, and doing all this changes a lot of the function of the land and the habitats. So what we're doing by these changes are we're disrupting the natural cycles of nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. We've disrupted the water cycles, groundwater is not being replenished. The um, movement of flora and fauna particularly the issue of invasive species that we have, um, and that's plants and animals. And sometimes it was well-meaning. We'll bring, um, we've talked about before about ornamental trees that were brought in, um, like in Bradford pear and things, and then started noticing, and that's how Dutch elm disease came here. And it was in some nursery stock that was discovered in the Bronx Zoo, or not Dutch elm, I'm sorry, American chestnut blight. Um, and then you've got the discharge of man-made toxins, wastes, and the pollution factors, ozone depletion, um, causing chemical composition changes in our atmosphere, which is we got to breathe, we got to have water to live. And again, as I said, using natural resources faster than they can regenerate, um, the fishing industry, the mineral extraction. So. My approach to this is it begins with you and your community. And I'm gonna talk about maybe five major topics about this, water conservation, home soil and yard conservation practices, waste management, which is the uh, reduce, reuse, recycle that we keep hearing about. There's an interesting story about that logo to a couple of students from, I believe MIT came up with that. Um, energy efficiency and community involvement. So the first topic would be water conservation. And I've, I've actually heard this from my parents. Why are we worried about water shortages? 75% or so of the earth's surface is water. Why do we have a problem with water shortages? Well, out of that fresh water is only about 3% and most of that is locked up in glaciers. So only 0.6% is available for home use, drinking and bathing. Um, probably industrial uses also. Um, there is desalinization projects around the world. It's expensive, it's not happening fast enough, um, but we still have a water shortage problem. And there's a big contrast. We're in the Midwest here. We don't hear it so much every day. Uh, Elizabeth, who's on, who doesn't have um, audio right now to be able to speak, um, she's in Colorado and uh, high desert anyway, but when you have droughts there, when the snowfall amounts are not as high, you have the wire wildfires. And I've got friends in Reno who I've seen wildfires from their house. Um, and I've traveled Northern California a lot and seen some pretty bad things. So we don't hear about that as much here. We have the occasional lightning strikes that will cause fires, but we don't have the drought like this severe long-term drought that they have so much in Western states. So on the water conservation, the steps we have, which has already been legislated somewhat, but the water saving toilets, but it's not, you know, older houses still have the older high flush toilets. Um, water saving shower heads, faucets, dishwashers, and washers. 
Um, repair your leaks and your drips. It does add up. Don't run water unnecessarily, like brushing teeth, cleaning, car washing, overwatering your lawn. Um, reduce soil erosion and water runoff. And that's the thing about spot watering I'll talk about a little bit too. Um, drought tolerant plantings, native plants are much better. And Don's gonna go into this also. Um, and then chemical, careful disposal of chemicals, keeping out of the water supply. You don't dump grease and oils into the sewers, anything that goes directly to the streams. You know, don't dump it down your garbage disposal. Cleaners and chemicals. Y you have to know that there is a cost to processing water and there's a point where things that cannot be removed. And in working on this this week, um, some surprising water use statistics, 40% of the home water usage is in the toilets. Baths and showers account for 32%. Laundry is 14% of the average home's water usage. Um, and here are some numbers that are kind of shocking, I guess I would say. The US and Canada use far larger quantities of water than any other country. Water conservation is also energy conservation, as I just said. It does take energy to process the water, to clean it up, to deliver the fresh water to the homes. Um, of drinking water per person per year, uh, um, the US uses 52,500 gallons per person per year. Canada, 40,300 gallons, Poland, 15,680. I don't know why they chose these countries on the list, but Belgium, 13,260. Um, developing nations more typically live on two to six gallons per person per day, if that. Um, and that water quality varies. I've contributed to a number of clean water projects that I've helped out in the past, but um, it's pretty rough. And we have it good here, better so in the Midwest than the West. And we have to be more conscious of this. Eastern Europe like that, they drink a lot more alcohol than we do. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot to produce that uh, <laughs> the vodka and things, yeah. So, and I and I don't know how they count that, if that does include the use of the, the, the single-use plastic water bottles or what. Um, for soil and yard conservation, the second part of this, um, one of the goals is to reduce or eliminate pesticides and fertilizers. Compost as fertilizer is the best option. Um, it manages your yard waste and organic household waste also. You've got the leaf litter and things instead of you know, putting it into the dump, use it as compost. There is a problem in a lot of big cities. It's easier in the country and we've hauled ours out to country property my parents have had because um, in the city, you have the rat issue. There are approved containers that you can buy. Um, the Soil and Water Conservation District, and I, I can put some things on the website too. Um, there are more rat-proof compost bins. Uh, this is a problem. Clintonville area here has a big problem with that. With uh, and, and the rats are all over the city. But Clintonville, with people meaning well, composting all of their food waste um, has brought more and more rats. And that's one of the worst areas and it's people meaning well, but the animals, the raccoons, um, the rats are really attracted to the organic household waste. Um, they talk about burying it lower, but when the problem is this bad, you really need one of those contained barrels that you can purchase um, in the county. When you are fertilizing, look for lower phosphorus and the nitrogen phosphorus fertilizer mix. Um, we actually use, we've got a friend that, you know, home use raises chickens and we dig into his pile that has been seasoned for a while and he brings us big grain sacks of, of chicken manure. And we've used that for a long time on our vegetable garden. Um, to conserve the water and help with the runoff issue also, Water, do your watering before 10 o'clock in the morning or earlier um, and after four. You don't wanna water when the sun is up. It's gonna evaporate more um, and you're just wasting your water on this one. 
um, not to mention the diseases that come along with this with the grass. Mow your grass higher to develop deeper roots and make it more drought resistant. Because we know in the summertime, our lawns are gonna go dormant. We have droughts in Ohio, July, August, sometimes even June. Um, and you've got to be just conscious of that. And there's at some point you, you need to quit watering and just say, let it go dormant. That's the best thing to do to save it. Um, zero scaping, that's the, the hardscape. Reduce your lawns. And my husband has a joke that we reduce our lawn. That's his goal to reduce the lawn size every year. The monoculture of the lawn has relatively shallow roots compared to what Don will talk about with native plantings. And it's just a waste. The chemicals that, if you, if you want the showpiece suburban lawn, the chemicals you put on it and what you have to do to keep it that way, and the weed control, which is not good for the pollinators either, it's pretty ridiculous. So we've, you know, we put a large pond in, we have a lot of different features. Um, mulched and stoned areas. And we just keep trying to reduce that. We, we, we're kind of in the, the area of growing more food, not grass. So we do a lot of gardening here too. And group your plants according to the water needs to minimize the overwatering. So put the sprinkle on the plants that need them the most. And again, consider drought tolerant varieties too. Um, if it has to be watered two or three times a day, re think about something else just to keep your flowers pretty. And I have lots and lots of flowers here, I assure you, blooming all year, but you've gotta be careful about where your water is going also. And mulching to prevent water loss, runoff and soil erosion is also very important. So one of the big things on household waste management is reduce what you consume what you buy and use sends less garbage to the dumps. Look about less packaging, bulk purchasing, um, reduce single use disposable items, particularly single use plastics. Um, for unwanted items, household items, instead of just packaging up in the garbage, and Elizabeth is very good about this. I know she's very good about this. Donate or sell unwanted items. Um, particularly donation. And if you need ideas of that, I can probably put some, next door has a lot of good ideas too, but I can put them um, on a list for Dawn for the website. There are a lot of free stories out there um, in churches that a lot of people in the community without showing a lot of info come in and shop for free. Um, a lot of emergency shelters will take donations. They have specific wants, but blankets and sheets and things. And you know, I, I get tired of the same old bedspread too, but instead of sticking it in, in your garbage bin, somebody else could use it. And when it's something that's just really too bad, um, the Don well knows the Ohio Wildlife Center will take towels and blankets and things. And there are things that can be made into uh, and repurposed for the animals too. Look for items that are made with post-consumer recycled material. Uh, for electronics, Ohio drop-off is what I've used for years and years. Um, and, and we'll post their addresses on the website too. Best Buy will take a lot back. Staples has even special turn-in days. They take back more than you can imagine. And sometimes they will give you credits. They'll have like a printer special or they'll give you you know, five or 10 or $20 toward a new printer if you buy it. Um, I take my ink cartridges back to Staples, not always, but occasionally I get vouchers back on my next ink purchase. Um, Accurate IT, I've also used for televisions. They do charge by the inch, but um, they have a full recycling facility there. Ohio drop off, I like. It's women run and um, some tough pretty awesome women in there and quite a good organization. And they are certified. Make sure you go to a place that is a certified recycler. Tech Used is another good, I've known some people who've worked there and Goodwill Industries um, take apart and recycle or resell things that you drop off. Um, and as an IT business owner and Elizabeth knows from her, she's a security IT person, um, Make sure you wipe your hard drives, your phones or whatever before you turn them in. Um, there are 
if you, know, if you have any questions, always ask me. You can get a, a CD that you can use on boot up to do like a, a four or seven pass military wipe of those that will wipe the hard drive out and rewrite it over you know, five, seven times to keep rewriting over it or else take it out and physically destroy it um, if you can't boot to it, but don't, don't turn in something that has data on it, just don't do it. Um, but, but Goodwill does use people with disabilities to help strip those and recycle them. Swaco is a great place. When I have something to recycle, I do not know where to take it. Swaco, I just call them. They answer questions about recycling where. Their website's quite good. It's the, the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. Um, they also answer questions about hazmat disposals, hazardous waste, um, and will tell you what you can and can't dispose of with them. They actually have a permanent site now, in addition to the regional usually at community centers that they have, um, particularly in the spring, but throughout the year, they have drop-off days. And I've been to a lot of those. They are, and I've actually worked some of those. They're, they're pretty zooey, but um, their permanent centers are worth it to go out to, to take things there. A lot of times with drugs, they used to tell you just to flush medications down the toilet. When you're talking about clean water here, that's not a great idea. Um, and it can contribute to the water contamination. Um, not recommended, like don't take it out and pour it in your backyard or whatever. Um, many pharmacies and police stations have brought boxes or free events where you turn them in. There's a website, rxdropbox.org that can help locate sites for you. Uh, a place to start is your fire station or police station or talk to a pharmacist. Myers take them back. I believe Kroger's does. I don't think CVS does take them back. I think they have special events there, but um, I've had elderly family members who've accumulated a lot of stuff that I've had to take care of on their, on their death or going to a nursing home. I've just had to take care of a lot of things. So, so dispose of it properly. Next topic is energy efficiency. And a lot of people, well, in condos, not, they're not allowed to dry your clothes outside. You can have like my, my daughter has like an indoor tree thing that she dries um, on her clothing. A friend of mine actually trying to save money on his drawing bill, not let his clothes shrink anymore during COVID times. He set up one of those, I think this is ingenious, one of those, um, those clothes racks that have like the zipper plastic lining over it. And it's like a, a metal clothes stand thing. And he put a box, he unzipped it at the bottom and put a box fan like laying it over the rack thing at the support of the bottom. And he puts his t-shirts and things in there. And he found out he's timed it. A load of his t-shirts dry faster with his little hanger rack system than it does in the dryer, plus saves him, you know, two bucks per load. But um, we do dry our clothing outside in the summer. We hang them up inside with a fan in the winter time. Um, we, we do do some lights in the dryer and certain things like towels, I would dry them outside a lot, but I just really hate that. Unless it's really windy and stuff, you just, and we go through long stretches of rain here, as you know, that we can't dry them outside. So on your dishes, make sure your dishwasher's on the air dry setting. Turn off your electronics when they're not in use. Um, I actually, I get tired of all the lights and you guys probably do too. Like my house is like lit up when I go to bed. So I unplug, I just quit caring about the timer on things. I unplug my microwave because that light is ridiculously bright. I have a radio I unplug at night because it's so bright. But, and I actually turn the power off to my TV because all the stereo and things, just they just have lights all over the place. I hate that. Um, so, and turn them off when they're not in use and, and shut your computer down if it's not too much of a problem. Thermostat and hot water heater temperatures, keep those both lowered to tolerable levels. Um, make sure you take care of the caulking and the weather stripping. It should be a good fall chore you should do, but, but keep up on that if you feel drafts from the windows. We actually bought one of those detectors that tell the different temperature differences so we can see what areas need attention. Repair leaky air ducts in the house. You're not spilling out your heated air all over the house. Uh, use frequent air filter replacement. I saw a hack recently about 
buy enough for the whole season, whether you do it monthly or every other month, whatever yours needs, but write on the packaging what month that is to be replaced so you know where you are and replacing those. Window coverings, open them in winter. My house faces north or south, I'm sorry, um, kind of southeast. So I get really great morning sun. And we've done experiments. We can incredibly raise the temperature of our house by just opening up the, the front door has all glass and opening up the window curtains and let the sun warm it in. Close them in summer. I've insulated drapes also to stop the heat from coming in. Um, and something we did a few years ago uh, when we were getting rid of a refrigerator, recycling a refrigerator through AEP, they have you do a home energy audit. And because it was COVID time, um, I think they can actually have somebody come to your house too, but we did this online. It was a quiz that we had to do, like a, a few modules and a quiz. And we got, I think, a $50 credit for turning in our older gas, our electricity hog refrigerator. But there is a lot of information on the different company websites, power and gas, about um, home energy practices for reducing it. And on the community involvement side, the next couple of screens are going to be a lot of um, links and things. And feel free to take a snapshot, but they will be on the YouTube. And also, I'm going to give Donna Page a links of these to put on the website. I'm a member of Green Columbus, greencbus.org. And I got involved with them because for years, my husband and I have worked on Earth Day projects with them. And I've done a lot of invasive removals at the OSU wetlands um, and various parks and working in metro parks and just helping with gardening and things too. But um, they're a wonderful volunteer driven organization. They've got a great mailing list. They haven't been meeting as much as they used to, but they still are very active online, sending out newsletters dedicated to um, sustainable living promotion, environment education, community involvement. Earth Day Columbus, they started it here in 2000 and seven as a more organized. I mean, there were little projects around, but they started coordinating them. Over 100,000 hours of service have been contributed since then. It, it's a really nice way to get involved also. And they have something called Green Drinks, informal meetup at local residents about the environment. And I'm on their mailing list also. Since I got on it, they have not met in person, <laughs> but uh, I have gone to a Zoom meeting, which has been kind of fun too. Just ideas and it's a great camaraderie for that organization. Um, there is something going on right now called the City Nature Challenge 2021 and is the statistics that I showed on the board there, but 2022, April 29th to May 2nd, they're gonna document, is kind of documenting Columbus environment and plants, fungi, other animals we have. And um, using iNaturalist, they're having you like go on hikes, go to parks, your backyard, and document water waste forest microhabitats within Columbus. So just kind of seeing what's out there. And um, so the steps to do that are create your own iNaturalist account at iNaturalist.org. You download the app, which is on the App Store, Google Play. Um, you sign into that new account you created. And on iNaturalist, you share your observations. You can take photographs to identify, and you can get feedback if you say, what is this plant? What is this tree? What am I seeing? What is this animal? And you will get feedback on what it is, but it's a way to document it and record it as a citizen scientist. Um, the City Nature Challenge started with two cities, which was, oh, I don't remember now, it's Los Angeles and I can't remember, it might've been Portland. But it started out with just two cities being involved, trying to, to do this. Um, and you can see how the observations have grown, the species detected. In 2021, 419 cities in the US were involved, um, and Columbus is one of them. And well, sorry, in 44 countries, sorry, cities still have 44 countries, um, 1.27 million observations. And they documented 45,300 species with about 52,000 observers. So this is the role that Don and I talk about with our OCVN about being a citizen scientist. Um, and I'll just kind of wind up here with, I have a bunch of resources of things that I've talked about and things to do at home, composting at home. There's an OSU extension agents are wonderful resources and they have um, videos and training on their site and 
Um, we've done classes through them. I'm doing a lot of classes through them actually, but their fact sheets are great. And these are, you just go and download these. You don't have to call and request them. Backyard enhancement for wildlife, which Don's gonna cover in a bit. Um, safe cleaning, help home, healthy home environment with cleaning materials, safer cleaning materials. Um, University of Florida Extension Office has a living green fact sheet about what you can do. Um, OSU also has native landscaping for birds, bees, butterflies, other wildlife, which I wanna go into another. I've taken a lot of classes about pollinators and you know, if we don't have pollinators, we're dead. And it's the food source, it's the food chain, it's the cycle of how important they are. That's why I go on and on and on about native plantings and plant things that the pollinators can use and thrive in. Um, there's also the Land Stewardship Resource Center, which they have, and I've got a typo in there, I will fix that, landstewardship.org. Um, great resources on that site also. So for unwanted items, we talked about that, you can list them on Nextdoor, Facebook Marketplace, freecycle.org, everything but the house, you can sell them there, ABTH, Craigslist, garage sale or donate. Restore is a place that will take larger furniture um, and you can donate to the free stores, furniture banks and things like that that help people get into apartments. A couple of good apps. I use one called Freebie Alert, which scans a lot of different uh, sites for items listed for free. And you get an alert as soon as it comes up. And I, I don't just give you guys the sites because I'm making this up. I use these a lot. Yesterday, I got the most amazing recumbent bicycle in brand new condition with a manual. Um, and it's a, uh, a folding recumbent bike. I gave away my last bicycle indoor bike because it was just way too big for my small house. And um, it was very noisy. This one is silent and it's great. And it's just the alert popped up. I sent her a message. She said it's in my carport, gave me the address. I picked it up and put it in the CRV. So it's great. So um, Buy Nothing is not as active in this area as it is in other places, but it's another great, uh, great site by community. Um, but Facebook Marketplace, you search for free items. It's amazing. And Nextdoor, I've gotten a few things from Nextdoor and I've given a lot away on Nextdoor too. It's great. So this is the Swaco Disposal Location Tool. Um, their permanent household hazardous waste disposal is on 8th Avenue, and these are the hours listed, which we'll put on the website too. Um, and then through a class that I'm taking right now through Denise Ellsworth at the Ohio State University B Lab, um, we had a speaker a couple weeks ago that three weeks ago that really inspired me a lot. Is Professor Doug Tallamy. Um, he has a website called HomegrownNationalPark.org. This, this guy is incredible. He's an incredible speaker. And I actually have a link, um, the third item here. You can watch the lecture that I attended three weeks ago. And I, I would highly encourage you to watch this. It's, it'll be, it's about an hour, a little less than an hour. Um, and uh, also I have research here about, and on his site too, about purchasing native plants and seed exchanges also. And there's a new one starting up in Columbus, but Doug Talmy is incredible. These are a couple of his books, Nature's Best Hope, A New Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard and The Living Landscape. I have them both requested from the library right now. I, I, I do buy a lot of books, but I try to get them from the library or eBooks first. But uh, this is just about sustainability and waking up about what you have to do. Um, I've got a list here of resources of seed exchanges and native plant prairiemoon.com is a wonderful site. Um, I mentioned before when we did it on butterflies, I guess about um, you can get free milkweed seeds with a self spread stance envelope or you can send a dollar in to help them out from livemonarch.com. Um, Ohio Native Plant Month.org has a native plants list that you can get and resources there. Um, there are various plant cells in the area. OSU has one every spring but they do have natives there also, um, just a wonderful resource. And I think this is my last slide, a little bit of recommended reading here. Um, Edward Wilson, who just died, I think the day after Christmas called Half Earth, and I think it was maybe 92 or so, Our Planet's Fight for Life. It's a great book. And I have that requested also right now. I've read 
lots of excerpts from it. And I had a lot of speakers reference that. Sand County Almanac, um, I read for one of my courses last year that I took. And um, Aldo Leopold purchased property, had family property, and he started documenting seasonal changes. Um, interesting thing they do even in your yard. He, he kept a diary um, and it's quite interesting, 1949, and he'd kept a diary for years, he published this. And then one that I keep hearing about that's fairly new called Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And it's more of an indigenous approach to being uh, more attached to the teaching of plants, the teaching what you can learn from the earth and your stewardship and involvement in that. But great books, um, if you wanna screenshot that. Uh, but it also, it, it's gonna be on the website and we'll put them on the um, Facebook page also. And that is it, Don. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Okay. We got 20 minutes here. Let me see what kind of damage I can do in 20 minutes. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. You're fine. That was all a lot of great information. Oh, Elizabeth wrote in here on the chat, Kroger and Meyer take back more than just grocery bags, anything plastic, dry cleaner bags, storage bags, food wrappers. Yeah. Yeah, I see you did that too, yep. Yeah, these are all really good things in the chat too. Thanks everybody. Okay, so my angle, if you will, on home stewardship is it really comes down to three things. Number one, making your property attractive to and a haven for wildlife and when i say wildlife i include things like, like wildflowers uh wild plants uh our natives um responsible management and upkeep of your property regarding wildlife and just simply put enjoyment of wildlife in your own backyard as the saying goes and I'm going to cover some points related to this. First of all, uh, making your property attractive to wildlife. Here are some things you can do. Plant native plants and gardens or planters, uh, as Christy already mentioned. Uh, some things which a lot of people probably do already and still birdhouses bird feeders and bird baths. Install a bat house if you have a little bit of property and a place to do that with. Uh, make and install a solitary, excuse me, solitary bee house. Add a garden fountain. And plant species favored by pollinators. So birdhouses, whether bought or made, are important to some species we know, like wrens, chickadees, and especially blue, bluebirds and tree swallows. Now, just a couple of examples here on the right. That is a wren house that I purchased a couple years ago. And on the left is a handmade gourd chickadee house, which is something I got into over the winter. Very easy to do, actually. If anybody wants instructions on how to do those, just let me know. Now, bird baths and feeders help sustain birds, especially during deep cold weather. The only thing about that is replace frozen water daily and the reason I say that is there are some species of common birds that will peck on the ice and they can actually damage or crack their beaks by pecking on the ice. Um, for squirrels, I know a lot of people don't like squirrels, but I do, uh, you can put out Peanuts, which I tend to put out more in the warmer weather, dried cob corn I put out during the winter, or also walnuts and acorns that you've saved from autumn. Now, 
Now, for a simple house for a solitary bee, uh, which we're talking about mason bees, carpenter bees, leaf cutter bees, et cetera, uh, it, it's fairly simple and you'll see why I do this. Um, you cut a piece of four by four post to between two to four feet long, however long you want it to be. And then you drill a series of evenly placed rows of three H inch hole, three H inch inch holes from two to two and a half inches deep. And those measurements are pretty firm. Um, it has been tried a number of different ways and these creatures want the three eighths inch hole and they want it at least two inches deep. Otherwise they will ignore it. Uh, then you drill mounting holes into the back corners at a 45 degree angle and use paracord, nylon rope or cord or wire to attach it to a fence. And as you can see in this photo, I've actually used paracord. It's pretty durable. Now this provides sol solitary bees individual homes. And obviously there's snow on the ground and you might be able to tell in a couple of these holes, especially this one in the lower left, uh, looks like it's filled in. Somebody's in there and uh, they've plugged up their hole for the year. If you mount one of these near to your house, it actually deters those types of bees from chewing into your awnings and needs to make holes. Another thing is you can install a garden fountain on the cheap and birds and insects like these. And these are just a few examples. Uh, these all come with pumps and then you, you've got the solar powered option. And uh, now these do not, like the two at the top, they don't come with the container that they are in. You have to provide that, but not such a big deal really. So that's a good thing you can do, uh, especially in a garden area. And now one of my favorite things, uh, especially since I really got heavily involved in this this year, hot composting for your garden and planting areas. Hot composting in a hot compost pit is the best and fastest way to generate good compost. And here are your steps, and I will post these on the website. You dig a pit eight inches deep and three inches wide and however long you want it to be. Line the, bot line the bottom of it with pieces of old board for drainage. Then you start to layer your materials. You put in a layer of soil and then a layer of brown matter which is dried leaves, sticks and twigs, uh, maybe even dried grass, um, something else you can do and I won't really get into it, but if you cut the branches off your Christmas trees, once the needles have gone brown, you can put those in. And then you add a layer of green matter, which is grass clippings and green leaves. Then add a layer of food scraps, and then you can repeat those steps three through six to however high you want this thing to be. And then you top it with a layer of three to five inches of straw to insulate it. And also to help with step nine, which is to water it thoroughly. Uh, the straw, especially in hot weather helps keep the moisture in. And you want that because the moisture um, aids the decomposition process. Now, the other thing you do that aids the decomposition process is once every two weeks, you remove that straw from the top and turn the pile with a pitchfork 
and add more food scraps. Then you re recover it with straw and water, but do not water it in freezing temperatures. If you do, that's going to slow uh, the decomposition process down to a crawl. And I guarantee you will pretty much make it impossible to turn that pile. The other thing is to not encourage digging by animals. Do not make your top layer under the straw food waste. Because remember, things like possums and dogs will dig in that and they do eat pretty much anything they can get their hands on or their, their paws on. <laughs> now, eventually you're gonna get to the point where that pile starts steaming. Once it does, you need to turn and water it every three days. These piles can heat up to 160 degrees. And if you're not turning it and watering it frequently enough, it can actually catch fire. It's been known to happen. Now, and this is just my personal thing. If you look on Pinterest or look at, at websites, you will see all kinds of recommendations uh, for doing this in barrels, doing it in trash cans, uh, putting, they tell you put a fence, rabbit fencing around your, um, around your compost pile. Uh, they show you to make these real fancy stockades around it in which you are using old pallets for walls. I don't recommend you do that personally because that makes it real difficult to turn the pile. And if you think about it, a standard pallet's 48 inches long. And if you've got those stood up on end around a pile, you know, the top of that's going to be up around your armpits. And it's not going to be very easy at all to get in there with your uh, pitchfork and really turn that material the way it needs to properly be turned. So do what you want, but I don't recommend it. Now, here, here is another idea. Um, keep what is called a slot bucket near your back door, uh, just so you got something to reach out the back door and deposit. Uh, your kitchen food waste into and collect for the compost bin. Uh, you want to make sure it has a closable lid to discourage wildlife, uh, but also has a few air holes in the lid to vent the decomposing matter. You don't want to take that lid off and get hit with something that makes you gag and knocks you off your feet. As a side note, I have read you can add meat and seafood waste to compost as long as it is not in great quantities. You don't want to, we don't want to toss in there um, half pot roasts and stuff like that. But if you got little scraps here and there, especially with the fat um, shells from your shrimp, it's certainly okay to do that. And now speaking of that, here's something that might come a little surprising. Besides food scraps from meals, you can compost these following things from your kitchen. Coffee grounds, entire tea bags and loose tea, um, paper towels, dryer lint, thread, popsicle sticks, Dead house plants, if you like me, we all got some dead house plants around. Um, flour, fruit skins and peels, uh, although seeds are not recommended. Um, seafood skins and bones, shellfish shells, as I already mentioned, and pulp from juicers, if, if you're not somebody that bakes with it or does something else. Just do not put food waste, uh, pet waste in it. That that's a, that you really don't want to do. That's that's not a good thing.
If you look online, I, I'm probably missing some things here, but there's a whole long list of things that are kind of surprising that you can't actually compost. And now here's something else. Some paper products are considered trash because they cannot be recycled. Things like pizza boxes, frozen food boxes, food soiled paper plates, bowls and cups, used napkins and paper towels. Most municipalities that do recycling do not allow you to re put those things in your recycling because they're not very easily recycled. Well, don't put them in your regular garbage. Use these to start fireplace or fire pit fires, or simply just burn them in your fire pit. The ash that results from that can and should be mixed in with your compost periodically to help raise the pH levels. Now the result of your efforts will be a large pile, as you saw mine, of pure healthy loam to turn into your garden topsoil or turn in with your garden topsoil. Now a misnomer, loam is not mulch. Loam is actually soil, you're making soil here, that retains water and holds nutrients well yet also drains well. It, unlike our soil around here, is equal in composition of sand and silt with little clay in it. It typically ends up being 30% sand, 30% silt, and 5% clay. Uh, the remainder, as you might remember from previous programs, is going to be uh, air space and water space and water. Um, incidentally, in case you didn't know, one thing I learned in um, putting together last week's program, and I don't know if I mentioned this or not, silt which is what muddies our streams every time we have heavy rains. Silt is actually grains of pulverized, um, um, shoot, not crystal. Uh, um, it, it's grains of pulverized, uh, what's the mineral, Christy? Not, not crystal. Um, quartz. It, it is pulverized grains of quartz that are smaller than grains of sand. You wouldn't believe it, but that's what that is. That is silt. So now I'm gonna talk for a few minutes, and I know I'll probably sound a little preachy here, uh, maybe more than a little. The downside of lawn and landscape chemicals on wildlife, and we're talking about pesticides, herbicides, spectrocides, fertilizers, they affect animals, mammals, including us, birds, insects, native plants, reptiles, and amphibians. And just to get a picture here, we may think that long chemicals are largely harmless, harmless. However, many kill things they aren't sold to kill and aren't supposed to kill. Uh, the, the chemicals leach into our topsoil and get into bodies of water through runoff, erosion, and through storm sewers. They can kill wildlife or cause them diseases or mutations. They can kill or make plants ill that we don't intend and pollute the water. And why this is important is partially because of this, bird populations throughout the country have declined over 70% since the early 1970s. And in the last 30 years, insect populations, depending on the group, 
worldwide have decreased between 45 to 80 percent. Um, on the bottom end of that scale, you have uh, simple beetles like lightning bugs, for example, that have been decreased 45 percent. And on the upper end of the scale, uh, odonatas, your dragonflies, damselflies, they've decreased by 80% over the last 30 years. Now, just to illustrate, and I'm not gonna read this whole thing. Here are one, two, three, four, five active ingredients in a popular lawn, we uh, lawn weed killer, and I'm not naming it. Uh, first one, toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects, long-term hazard. Number two, harmful if swallowed and is toxic if inhaled, very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects. Can irritate skin, eyes, and respiratory tra tract. If inhaled may cause a burning sensation in the nasopharynx and chest coughing and or dizziness, headaches, vomiting, and diarrhea may cause confusion and bizarre or aggressive behavior along with kidney failure and increased heart rate. Can also cause uh, metabolic acidosis resulting in peculiar breath order. It is a tetragen in rats at moderate to high doses may be mutagenic at very high doses. A study of people employed in the manufacture of that chemical in herbicides showed an association between those herbicides and cancer of soft tissues and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, chemical number three, uh, EPA rates the oral toxicity as slight based on a study of rats. However, it is considered to be a severe eye irritant. Uh, there has been concern that this one may cause cancer. And in 1987, the International Agency for Research on Cancer ranked this class of compounds as group 2B, possibly carcinogenic to humans. Chemical number four, uh, a little wake-up call, it's commercially used on asparagus, cereals, corn, grasses, hay, rice, sorghum, soybeans, sugarcane, on pasture and rangelands for the control of annual mustard. The warnings uh, through EPA are harmful if swallowed, acute toxicity oral, may cause allergic skin reaction, reaction causes serious eye damage or irritation, may cause respiratory irritation, warning for specific target organ toxicity, uh, single exposure, respiratory tract irritation, harmful to aquatic life, again, with long lasting effects, long-term hazard. And then the fifth chemical in this compound, causes skin irritation, uh, corrosion and or irritation, causes serious eye irritation, damage and or irritation, may cause respiratory irritation, specific target organ toxicity, single exposure, exposure respiratory tract, and note that one, they test on dogs to find that out, believe it or not. The actual EPA label says this is uh, in terms of hazard to humans and domestic animals, causes substantial but temporary eye injury, harmful if swallowed, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. Do not get on eyes or on clothing. Avoid breathing, spray mist, and contact with skin. Wear long pants, long sleeve shirt, socks, shoes, rubber gloves, and eye protection when mixing, loading, or applying. Um, recommended safety glasses, including front brow and temple protection be worn. After using this product, wash all non-disposable gloves thoroughly with soap and water before removing. 
Remove clothing and launder separately before reuse. Promptly and thoroughly wash hand and, hands and exposed skin with soap and water. Remove saturated clothing as soon as, as possible and shower. Do not allow people uh, or pets on treatment area during application. Um, people and pets may enter treated area after spray has dried. So again, I know I'm being preachy here, but after hearing all that, ask yourself, if a chemical causes, and you read these labels, causes a severe eye irritation to humans, what do you think it will do to a bee's compound eyes? And we know bees are um, of concern and some are endangered. If it's a carcinogen, how will it affect salamander eggs? Um, if in water it can cause reproductive harm in humans, what about other fish and the animals that eat them? You know, it turns out after all, when you read that, the, the funny thing on the Simpsons about the uh, fish in the river that had three eyes, maybe not so funny after all. And then if it is very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects, what about when it gets into our drinking water, our reservoirs and uh, water supplies? Yeah, food for thought. But I'm not gonna leave it on that note. I mean, think about, do you really wanna be a part of that? But there are options. Here are just three wildlife and human friendly lawn and garden products and I'm going to uh, I'm going to post these on the website. First of all, repels all and I've used this for several years. Uh, keeps animals off your plants like in particular I use it to keep the rabbits off my hostas. Um, last two months per application, it's all natural ingredients. Um, it's got like, I don't quote me on this, but I think it's got like peppers in it and, you know, hot peppers and fox urine and some things. Wow, Supreme in the middle um, works below the surface of the soil to prevent weeds, uh, uh, targets them during germination. Um, it also contains an all natural fertilizer. And then on the far right, a lot of people like to uh, or feel the need to uh, spray their lawns for mosquitoes, you know, um, stop the bites. Uh, this product is a natural mosquito and tick repellent. It's an all natural spray that kills within 24 hours of application. Um, it performs at the same uh, efficiency rate as the leading toxin spray, but without the harmful, harmful chemicals. It's 100% kill rate in the first 24 hours. 100% that is uh, for mosquitoes, 100% tick kill rate in the first hour. And it repels for up to four weeks. Uh, they've tested in labs. It is family, pet, bee, and butterfly friendly. So that's just three examples. I'm not going to lie to you. You are going to pay a little more for these things than you are like a Scott's or an ortho product or what have you, but I think it's worth it. The other thing down at the bottom here, uh, this notice, the disadvantages of synthetic lawn fertilizer, and I, I think a lot of people don't know this, I didn't know it, the synthetic ingredients found in those actually disrupt the natural growth cycles of grass. Uh, they promote thatch buildup and inhibit the proliferation of beneficial soil microorganisms. Uh, lawns, using these products get a quick but short-lived boost, um, but then their salts 
drive out the salts and the products. In other words, drive out the life in your soil until it's worn out and even more dependent on synthetics and vulnerable to insect and disease damage than it was before. They also require more applications. And again, as we've mentioned, children and pets have to stay off the lawns for a while uh, after applications. So that's the end of my preachiness. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't say anything, but it is uh, something I care about. Okay, so we are, we've run over a little bit. It's a good thing we didn't plan on doing uh, um, nature trivia tonight because we're at uh, 10 after. Just very quick before we jump off here, since I misstated it last time, uh, Christy, what are the actual dates for the Great American Bird Count this month? Just ask me too quick. I'll tell you in two seconds. Um, th this is the backyard bird, bird count. Yeah, uh, I thought it was the 12th through the 15th, but that's not. No, the I think the 16th. Um, let me tell you just a second. I'll get it in two seconds. Like our bird count 2022 is. So I'm getting it confused with that uh, webinar that they have. Um, um, uh, coming up right now. Yeah, I'm sorry, 18th to 21st. 18th to 21st. The, the 16th is that webinar they're having. I'm really sorry, my internet went down for like a long time and it shut me out of the Zoom. And I just ended up, I'm on my phone now because. Uh, and it's just come back up here. So it's crazy. Yeah, I saw you pop back into the waiting room. So I let you in. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad it didn't come off during my presentation. I would have been a little upset about that. But yeah. Okay, well, that's all we have time for this evening. Um, we really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope you will all come back again, like like we know Linda Ray is going to time and time again. Yes, love seeing you, Linda. It's wonderful. Incidentally, I was with Glenda last night at Corey Trails, and that was a lot of fun. I love her dog. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody have a good night, and we will see you all next time. Um, I always get asked. Let me. Look real quick. Next week, uh, our program is going to be on. We change things around a little bit. Uh, I think we're back to tree identification. Oh, which should be a good one because we skipped that one. Yep. So, tree identification. Something. Right, It'll be a lot about yeah. bark right now, a little bit about leaves later on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Did you, did all right, you start, guys. Did you start to yeah, say I, something, Jim? No, I just started to say, all right, thanks for the presentation. Look forward to uh, catching you on the next one. Good, good. I, I hope so. so. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night. All right, you too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, Linda. It was very good. Bye-bye, Linda. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Don, you still there? Yeah. I, I am going to jump off of here because I need to get my butt in bed early. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I've got to uh, walk. Um, tree identification is um, not, I'm not great. Do you already have a presentation? Um, because, because we, the only other thing we've got left. Is the Native American one, the indigenous cause, one? Because we jumped ahead to aquatic life and mammals and mammal history uh and this one actually well no not this one we've got unusual and hidden ohio places that'll be better for the a little bit later in the spring yeah we had had skipped over tree identification what okay. i could try to do and i mentioned this before um you know my niece's husband uh 
owns an Arbor company and he is a former four or five time past president of the natural national arborists association. And he's also written books on this topic. Let me, oh. let me shoot a message tomorrow and see if I can get him to just come on and give an informal talk about it. Tree and, and, and actually we can tie that in with stewardship about managing the trees of yeah. your property and what to look for. And, and then, and, and I can work on, it's something that I need to learn, but I don't, I mean, I, I know the big ones, but I don't have the greatest of the working knowledge, but what I would like to do that I think I have from my paper is, um, and piggybacking with what I've been working on, it'd be like, what we talked about last week about the percentages of Ohio that was forested. Yeah. I can go back on some trivia about that. Plus I have other sites saved, but let's take a break and think about it this weekend and yeah. see if you can get him to talk a bit. That would well, be great. I can maybe get him to do that. And you know, the last book he published actually uh, is titled The Trees of Ohio. Oh my goodness. And each book has a page with a photo and a whole bunch of information, sometimes two pages, about every single tree species found in Ohio. That's crazy. And he tells whether they're native or not, whether they were introduced, and just the whole ball of wax and any any you know, issues they have like the ash borers or anything. Was this the, uh, like Ohio DNR? I, I think I even have that. The Trees of Ohio Field Guide publication that they, he's got like a separate book, right? He's got a separate book. Wow. He wrote, he wrote this himself and, okay. uh, um, you know, cause like I said, he, he does all this professional stuff and you know he's like he's on the board of directors for the wildlife center he's on the board of directors for uh the uh you know the franklin county uh franklin county conservancy yep downtown wow he does a lot of work for them on their property and stuff his company does um he he just he he does all kinds of stuff you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna in advance of it i'm gonna put this on the facebook page yeah because i, I have a hard copy of this that i got somewhere but it's the trees of ohio field guide from the division of wildlife uh-huh um, i may have that um, yeah i may have and, that yeah and i was thinking about because we got it, I like, got my last OCVN class, um, but I've got the downloads. So even if um, people want to learn about it in advance, that would be great. I think I have that. I know I have the Audubon Field Guide to uh, Eastern American Trees, mm -hmm. and I know I've got another older one that was my brother's yeah, from college. I have some really old ones from my parents and my grandparents, like because I told you my mom used to be a tree farmer and yeah. uh, official designation that worked on preservation. So I have a lot of interest, but this is not one of my strengths and it's ridiculous that it's not. Yeah, it's not one of mine either. And I, I, I wish it was more so. Yeah. The other and I only recently learned about what I thought were um, bur oaks, the chinkapin oaks, and I learned more about that yeah. recently too and but then like you know the whole northern red oak and pin oaks yeah. and i just i can usually identify a pin oak but then there's a scarlet oak i'm looking at that and, and i never and, would know the shingle oak yeah and the other thing kind of related to that that i want to learn a whole ton about and i started especially after what i saw today um is on funguses and lichens yeah i'd love to do I've a program on that and i've learned to identify like maybe 12 to 15 of them 
turkey tail. I, I know a few of them. I'd yeah. really like to know just a whole lot more about that subject. Enough I have to be able to really like, give an intelligent presentation. That's part of like what we do is I do this to learn more and to brush up. I, my Don, your short term, your memory and long term is much better than mine is. And my head just is so full of IT stuff for so many years, that I've just forgotten. And so, yeah. you know, these presentations, I feel like I'm so fraudulent sometimes because I got to just relearn everything every time. But I love it. I love every minute of it. I do too. You know, I add my own editorials, but I got to do, you know, what I know is put in there, but I got to do a lot of research for it. But that's why you do your presentations faster than I do. <laughs> oh my God. I still have this. I probably oh talk God. too fast. No, you were, you're wonderful. Oh, I can't wait. Loki's next to me still. Hi, he's kitty. Been to, Hi, kitty, kitty. He, he's been next to me all day. It's yeah. Very clingy. And I don't know why Graham is out. He's got a friend who's a net jets pilot who's in town for some training right now. And um, we went out to dinner last night and I just, ugh, I ate too much fish and chips and they were going out today. And I was like, I cannot go. I got my presentation. Um, really quick too, I got to tell you, I don't know the dates yet, but the last week of March and first week of April, um, I'm going to be in New England. I'm going to New Jersey for a conference with Graham and then staying with friends there and then we've got um our friends in connecticut that we're gonna go see again yeah we're at and new jersey something. um i'll tell you in two seconds and i stayed there last year and again short-term memory is just turning to crap let me tell you um this was it's called amps 2022 and it's at a police hall i can just picture it and it is this is the Armor Modeling and Preservation Society, AMPS. And it is 22, oh, no, must be Mosquito Con. That was Newport News. Hang on, Mosquito Con. It's not AMPS, Mosquito Con 2022. Okay, let's see if that's the one. I haven't made the reservations yet in the hotel, so I'm working on it. Um, New Jersey RPMS, Wayne. Wayne, New Jersey. Okay, yeah, that's northern part of the state. Yeah, so, um, so there, and then we're gonna be around New Haven area, Woodbridge, Connecticut is where we're gonna stay with our sort of pseudo daughter. Yeah, Wayne so, uh, is uh, up around the Sitai. <laughs> yes, not far at all. And we had a, uh, and I forget where our friend lives, about 45 minutes from there, a little bit further west and north. But um, but we, uh, yeah, and, and then staying with a friend. We had a lovely hotel there, and Wayne was pretty, pretty nice. And it was in a police hall, and it was very respectful. And their numbers are getting back to like safety levels lower than ours. So Connecticut, New Jersey, mm -hmm. New York, their COVID numbers are dropping. So I'll feel. Well, New Jersey <laughs> just dropped their uh, mask mandate for schools. Yep. A few days ago. Hopefully they'll still have it at the convention, but I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to get my appointment for Tuesday for my third COVID shot. I putting it off and putting it off because of various things. We've got tickets for this dinner Monday night for Valentine's with my parents. We do every year at Bolton Field. And um, so I, uh, and I, I thought, well, I could have gotten it tomorrow because I didn't want to interfere with tonight. And then if I get it Tuesday, that's the thing. I If, if I don't have to do too much next week, I'll do a few things. But if I can't, you know, I don't know how I'll feel. Could be a couple I, of days. I had all this questioning about mm -hmm. whether or not, I don't know if I told you about whether or not I needed a third shot. Yep. And the people at the transplant center uh, told me that they recommend I get a third shot uh, six months, as soon as possible, six months 
uh, after the last day of whatever my quarantine date was. Six months after that? Wow. Yeah. I'm surprised it's that long. So like the end of April. Wow. And they, okay, so they said, they said that even despite um, knowing you had the J&J, did you have J&J for all of them? Yeah. Okay. It, I, I just read a few minutes ago that they stopped, um, they've stopped manufacturing now because it's just not yeah. Manufacturing. yeah. I Well, you know, the thing was, and I kind of knew this was, was, was coming, you know, my dad had gotten it. Yep. COVID and he had had the the J and J shots. Yep. And when he was uh, when he was tested at the clinic, they, they said you have almost nothing in a way of antibodies in you. Yep. Like how are they to know? Everybody did what they could, and my older my oldest daughter and her husband both got the J and J, and they both got COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the only reason I even got the J&J &J was because I was in a rush because of my status yep. and my immunocompromised, uh, you know, compromised position to get what I could as quick as I could. Exactly. Yep. And for my age and my immunocompromisation, uh, the first thing that came available was J and J and I jumped on it. Yep. Yep. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yep. And I, it's, it's just really tough. And my, I don't think, I don't know if I told you this, my sister-in-law who had a liver transplant, um, I think weekend before last got tested positive. My brother brought it back from the, um, Beechcroft like coming factory where he works. He's a engineer and supervising a new project as a consultant. And despite masking and distancing, he got it. Oh, yeah. And and the scare was because his wife is a gosh, 27 years, I think now, liver transplant. Um and uh they separated them he had a different bedroom and everything but it was already too late with omicron yeah and she did get it and so she had to have the monoclonal antibody infusion because you know she on anti-rejection drugs for 27 years she's been so sick and so anyway we were so scared about her but they were monitoring her so closely ready to put her in the hospital um but she's okay it was her birthday on the 8th so um, i need to talk to her actually so anyway well i gotta let you go and get some sleep i had a crappy night too. yeah i know me too i definitely got to get there yeah i saw yours so late it's like wait a minute it's three o'clock and i'm up yeah so yeah i want to be in bed by nine o'clock okie dokies all righty well, good take job care. tonight you really does look great you you look so much younger with your hair like that thanks and good job good, tonight right? you killed it thank you thank you very yep. much and yours was so interesting yours was so good too good teamwork because yep. i just did the general i just kind of went with it and you did we're, the specific this time and sometimes it's the opposite so we're the nature good. tag team yeah baby okay right. we'll talk we'll see you bye, -bye.